Hello and welcome back to our networks, the evolution of living systems. Last time we dove deeply into the organization of an organism, and that's a very complicated concept. So this organization consists of a form of organizational closure. It's a closure to efficient causation, where all the efficient causes that you need to generate the living system that you are, to continue, to maintain it, they need to be accounted for from within the system, right? So that makes living systems special. That makes them different from non-living organisms. So we've looked at Rosen's basic abstract definition of a metabolic repair system here, um, parsing this cryptic diagram that he has in his book. And we looked, um, according to Yanni Hofmeyer's work, how these abstract sort of mappings in Rosen's um, account of closure uh, correspond to different aspects of cellular metabolism. In particular, the enzymes and ribosomes that produce um, intermediary meta metabolism and macromolecular synthesis, um, the cellular milieu that allows proteins to fold and self-assemble into ribosomes and enzymes in their functional form, and the transporters at the cell membrane that cause, um, uh, that regulate, that generate this stable intracellular milieu that is so important. And I pointed out that at least one of those efficient causes, the intracellular milieu, is a function of the entire um, system the entire organization of the cell. Okay, so, so what we're talking about here is a global organization that you cannot necessarily decompose into its components. But I, I said at the beginning of last lecture, there's also a problem with the recomposition of a system like that with dynamical systems theory. We will mainly discuss that in next lecture. But before I can do that, I need to sort of address a few problems with this basic relational account of the organization um, of the organism. So one really big problem is how, this is a static network figure again, it's a topological explanation. So how is this actually happening? What is the underlying causal structure of this relational diagram? So we need to move back um, like we did before. And so one way to do this is to look at the actual reactions that occur in a metabolic network. And this is work that was pioneered by Stuart Kaufman um, in the 80s, a very famous paper in 1986, uh, and extensively described in his fabulous book, The Origins of Order. This is a career-defining book for me. So uh, it's, a, it's a difficult book to read, but it's, it's an, an extremely important book in biology. We'll come back to it when we talk about networks and their evolution. Uh, so, these sort of, you can imagine a set of metabolic reactions. And basically, these sets of metabolic reactions, they can also have a sort of clo a closure. Meaning that if you produce every component in, that you need in this network, from within the network, then you get something which is called an autocatalytic set, autocatalysis. So every component in this biochemical network is producing, uh, is produced from another, uh, through the action of another component in the system. Very similar to this um, concept of uh, closure to efficient causation, but it's, this is just a catalytic closure, a closure of a reaction network. And there's a special set of uh, autocatalytic networks called RAF sets, reflexive autocatalytic systems generated by a food set. So they, they allow um, sort of uh, input from foodstuffs and uh, then you, there's different components here and there. So the foodstuffs are not produced from within the system, but everything else, you can also see the difference between catalysis and actual um, uh, conversion of, of metabolites. And you can see, so, so uh, this uh, enzyme here is producing one of the metabolites. Um, uh, which is then converted into this other sort of uh, uh, 
metabolite or enzyme here and so on and so forth. I don't want to go into detail here, but the point is that in these networks, very similar to the closure of, of efficient causation before with Rosen, every reactant is either produced internally or harvested through food from the environment. Okay, so this is just for historical context because Stuart then went on to, to wonder how is it that such autocatalytic networks can produce uh, a living um, organism with autonomy and agency. And so he thought about this in much more thermodynamic terms and, you know, than, than, than Rosen, much less abstract. So basically, he's saying living systems are autonomous agents. An autonomous agent must be an autocatalytic system able to reproduce and able to perform one or more thermodynamic work sites. So the reproduction here means it doesn't have to have children. It, it just has to sort of self-maintain, which is a property of its autocatalytic nature. So that's okay. So what does he mean by perform one or more thermodynamic work cycles? So work, he defines a purely physical, standard physical term, um, is the constraint release of energy. So this is interesting. So this autocatalytic set needs to produce some sort of energy that can be channeled into work. And this work can be used to create more constraints on the release of energy. So this is a concept of organization, constraint. We've, we've had this concept before. We'll come back to it later on in this lecture. So basically, if you have work that is used to create more constraints for channeling more work in a certain direction, you become somewhat independent of this general network of all the possible chemical reactions. So you can, if you want to imagine it, you can steer which reactions are gonna happen and which ones are not. You can sort of choose, I'm using this word very carefully here, which direction uh, the reactions should go. So this network can produce its own dynamics that's independent of the general thermodynamical background. Okay, so it can lift itself up somehow by producing uh, channeling reactions into a direction that produce more uh, work, constrained energy to produce more constraints. So it's a self-propagation of constraints. This will be the central topic of today. So basically, there is a certain freedom. This is the needful freedom of Hans Jonas again. The system can be autonomous in some way. In his book, Investigations, which is actually, despite its uh, somewhat difficult language, it is a very interesting book to read if you can get past the writing style. So there is a very funny example in there. I don't know what Stuart was thinking when he came up with this, but it's very memorable because it's so funny. Okay, so he illustrates the idea of non-propagating and propagating work with a cannon and a cannonball. Well, this far, it's actually quite intuitive and it's okay. So you have a cannon, it shoots a cannonball and it lands, it makes a hole in the dirt, hopefully hurting nobody, a little crater and that's it. So the energy dissipates, it doesn't propagate. The work that's been done to shoot the cannonball does not do any additional work. But now you could imagine, and this is where it gets a little strange, you can imagine that you shoot the cannonball onto a paddle wheel that gets a bucket out of a well and irrigates a field, Kaufman's bean field, this is an actual drawing from his book, where beans grow. I think the example would be better if it would be a cannon field, if it would gr be growing cannon, but, but it would be really, really even more strange. But so <laughs> despite its um, shortcomings, you, you get the point. So if you can actually um, do useful work with the energy that you would otherwise dissipate if you do something, then you can produce more. So in the, if, if you could grow cannons here, you could shoot more cannonballs. Okay, this is what I wanted to get across. And I'm not sure I should have used this example, but it's in the book, I recommend the book. And so this idea of a work constraint cycle, that's, that's it, okay? So you basically go through work, 
you use work to build up more constraints which allow you to do more work. And this is a way of building up this sort of complicated organization that you get in an organism. But there's still a problem here if you think about it. So you think back to this abstract diagram of, of roses. Everything is caused by something else. So this example that, that um, Kaufman just gave us is an example of a recursive system. Okay, you go through cycles, you iterate through different cycles, and you build on the execution of a previous cycle. The next cycle has to build on the previous cycle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a form of recursion, okay? You iterate through these cycles, and through this type of iteration, recursion, you build up more constraints. But that doesn't, doesn't really help here because every efficient cause is generated from within the system. So that's slightly different. Let me explain that with a funny example that I got from um, another book that I love, and that's Dennis Walsh's book about uh, organisms and agency. And so Dennis uses uh, an example that um, is also very memorable to explain the difference between recursion that I just explained and something called impredicativity, which affects Rosen's diagram. Okay, so let's see. Recursion, let's use two famous philosophers of science, uh, Winston Churchill and Karl Marx to illustrate this. Churchill once said, we shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. So you live and work in a building and you become the person you are because of the building you live in. The building is a thing, it exists without you. You are a thing, you exist without the building, the house you live in. But there's a reci reciprocal influence. There's a feedback, a causal feedback between the two processes. And so if you reiterate this, you get a recursion and you get a recursive sort of modification of the people and the buildings through cultural evolution. Okay? So this is a sort of a case of reciprocal causation. There are two things or two processes that influence each other, but they exist independently of each other. But Rosen's diagram is different. All the efficient causes in Rosen's diagram or in Yanni's scheme of the cell, they generate each other. So it's much more like this quote from Karl Marx, who says, the animal is immediately one with its life activity. The animal is what it does. The system, remember, I said that before, is what it does. A dynamical system is what it does. It does not distinguish itself from it. So this is a more radical view. This is not two independent sort of things that influence each other through reciprocal causation uh, and causal feedback. This is reciprocal constitution. These causes don't even exist without each other. They have a dialectical relation. If one doesn't exist, the other one doesn't exist. They can constantly interact back and forth and they need to generate each other to exist in the first place. So there's a bunch of questions here. The one affects the origin of life. I can't cover this in this lecture, but it's a very big question. How do you get such a process running in the first place? Okay, so and this is the problem of impredicativity. Basically, you have two processes that need each other to exist. How do you get them um, to start? They both need each other, and that's stronger than recursion. They, 100% depend on each other for each other's existence. So a dialectical re relation means complete existential dependence, not just causal feedback. And I hope you understand why this is different. This is stronger, okay? So we need to deal with this somehow. Okay, but once life existed, these, pro you know, they just constantly, constantly generated each other, these processes, these causes. And so let's get back to this beautiful uh, quote by Jacques Monod. I, I, I told you to read Ch Chance and Necessity because it gets things wrong in, very clear, uh, in a very clear way. So here's this quote again. Through its properties by the microscopic, mi microscopic clockwork function that establishes between DNA and protein, the dogma, the central dogma of uh, molecular biology, as between organism and medium and its environment, an entirely one-way relationship. Wow. This system obviously defies any dialectical description. It is not Hegelian at all. So Hegel was the one who, of course, came up with the idea of dialectics, but thoroughly Cartesian. The cell is indeed a machine. Monod gets it 
beautifully, spectacularly and clearly wrong here. The essence of a living being is this dialectical relationship between its efficient causes, this hierarchical cycle. So fundamentally, okay, cells are, di uh, are hegelian. And this is why they're not Cartesian. They are not machines. Organisms, cells are not machines. And as cool as you look with your cigarette in your lab, Jacques Monod, you are wrong. And the machine view that you're propagating there is completely mistaken. Okay, so how is this actually implemented? Let's move away from, from single cells and metabolism and, and look at organisms, multicellular organisms. Um, not only, but um, I'll give you an example for a multicellular organism. So how do, you, how do you apply this to anything real, right? Again, this is a problem. So you have, you have this scheme by Rosen, this closure, and then you have work constraint cycle that need, need to be done. And then you have this sort of co-generation, these different um, processes that need to co-construct, co-generate each other. So what are those processes? And so there's a very interesting account, uh, an interesting view that was developed by Giuseppe Longo, Anna Soto, uh, Carlos Sonnenschein, Maelo Monteville and others, um, also in part working uh, and building on Stuart Kaufman's work um, that provide a very simple account of, of what living systems really are fundamentally. And so they introduced this very useful concept of a biological default state. It's a bit of a misleading term. It's not really a state, it's a default process. Really. Okay, and that process is cell proliferation with variation and motility. If you let a cell be, what does it do by default? It divides, okay? But the daughter cells don't look exactly the same. They don't have the exact regulatory state and so on. And sometimes cells differentiate into different shapes, different forms, different functions. And so this is the basic behavior uh, of a cell and they move around in search of food. And there are also movements within the cell, intracellular transport, organelles are, you know, transported around vesicles, etc. So uh, uh, a certain motility, which is broader concept than locomotion is also important. So here, three ingredients, proliferation, cell cycle regulation is one of the most conserved um, sort of processes in any living system. So even the first common ancestor of all life must have uh, been able to proliferate, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Um, and so what this immediately tells you is that you don't need to explain cell division. You need to explain when cells don't divide. This will become when we talk about multicellular organisms, of course. There is variation in pro proliferation because cells never divide precisely equally. And of course, there is this whole argument about the stochastic nature of the underlying processes and the regulation uh, within the cell that I gave you uh, uh, two lectures ago. And so motility not only means locomotion, but also intracellular transport and even unequal growth. You can grow into a certain direction, like a plant can move towards the light in this sense. Okay, fundamental. So this, um, the authors write, is the fundamental process underlying any living system. And it has a default state that's a bit like the default state of a moving object in Newtonian physics is just to move along uh, without Alex acceleration in a straight line, right? And so this is sort of the ground state of biology, they say. But it's very different from this physical inertial ground state because the biological default state is characterized by constant intrinsic initiation of activity that comes from these work constraint cycles that I gave you before. Okay, so I'm, I wanna use this to illustrate how constraints and processes can interact to create organizational closure. So we're no longer looking at sort of the metabolic processes that create the cell. We're looking at how cells create a, a multicellular organism, okay? And so what the organism does, whether it's unicellular or, or, or multicellular, is it, it modifies this default behavior, okay? So it imposes, um, uh, regulatory constraints on this um, uh, default behavior of simple, you know, random variation uh, 
and division that you see going on in the background. Stop it now. So basically, what the organism can do here is it can constrain the degrees of freedom of this process, okay, without being affected itself at the, the, the spatial or temporal scale of the process. That's the definition I gave you earlier about what a constraint is. So basically, here you have a, a specific example of a process, an underlying process, that is then being um, sort of channeled by constraints. All right? And so that idea of processes, generative processes and their constraints, is not just a causal feedback. Okay, so because the constraints in the system are themselves produced by the underlying processes and the processes are of course constrained by the constraints. So you have this co-generation, just like in Marx's view before. So you have a perfect uh, in, in predicative situation here where the two different processes are producing each other. Okay, and of course that goes back um, to this idea of the efficient causes. Um, Enzymes, remember, were an efficient cause in the Annie Hofmeyer scheme, but also a constraint, a, a prime example of a constraint when, we introdu when I introduced this, this example um, much earlier on. Okay, so it's all connected somehow. And on top of it all, constraints and processes are a multi-level phenomenon. Remember that constraints are interlevel, represent interlevel causation. The system is imposing a constraint. There is a cellular milieu that's controlled by everything in the cell that imposes a constraint on how the molecular processes of the metabolism are running underneath. And these metab metabolic processes are in turn generating those constraints and so on and so forth in this co-generation dialectic that I was showing you before. So to look back, at, at Yanni's um, scheme of the cell, you have the enzymes and the ribosomes that catalyze covalent chemistry, the building blocks and the macromolecules that the cell must build. So imagine the network of all possible reactions. The enzymes and the ribosomes channel these by doing work into a direction that allow them afterwards to produce more work to change the metabolic state of the cell yet again, to adaptively rebuild that metabolic state at every moment in time. The cellular milieu is produced by not just the transporters, okay, but by the whole configuration, the boundaries of the cell need to be there and everything. Okay, it enables the, the correct folding itself assembly. So this is the process, the underlying process is just thermodynamic folding thermodynamic self-assembly, but in the context of the cellular milieu, it becomes self-organization, okay? And so uh, then the transporters are, of course, uh, uh, produced um, by uh, step number one and uh, themselves uh, selectively uh, control these normal physical chemical processes of ion fluxes across membranes, and they control them using, using energy. Um, and thereby establish and maintain the intracellular milieu. There's a constant, in each one of those cases, there's a constant interaction between constraints and underlying physical chemical processes. And now these physical chemical processes, there are no physical laws that are being broken here, but the structure of the constraints on top are not described by any physical or chemical laws that we know of. They are a property of the organism. Biology has its own rules, that describe this, this organization of the, the, the organism. It doesn't make sense to try and explain them at the level of physical and chemical laws because the organism has a certain autonomy in regulating those constraints when it constantly regenerates them, adaptively um, renews them, okay? And that is the fundamental hierarchical cycle with which uh, there is closure in the cell and with which it produces uh, its autonomy. Okay, so you can look at organizational closure the way uh, that Hofmeier and uh, Rosen do in terms of closure of efficient causation. 
But now we can also look at it as the closure of constraints, okay? Constraints are efficient causes. I told you before, they're, they're completely legitimate Woodwardian counterfactual interventionist causes. So this is work done by uh, Alvaro Moreno and many people in his group, especially uh, my colleagues, Matteo Mosio and Mael Monteville, who work in Paris, uh, and many others that I apologize that I don't mention here. So they came up with what they call the organizational account of the organism. And they say biological organization is to, is to be understood as a closure of constraint. Okay, not just any efficient cause, but those efficient causes that act as constraints in the organism. So only thermodynamically open dissipative systems show this kind of closure because you need these work constraint cycles that Kaufmann came up with, and those, I should have mentioned that before, only happen in thermodynamically open, far from equilibrium systems. Organization, the closure of constraints, is the characteristic feature of organisms. No other systems but living systems have a closure of constraints like this. And if you don't have it, you're dead, okay? Closure of constraints realizes self-determination, autonomy, in the way that I tried to explain before. It lifts you out of this background network of chemical reactions and it allows you to have some sort of control over which direction you put work into the system to control in which direction the constraints will be channeled next, okay? In this sort of not just recursive, but impredicative, uh, co-generating um, sort of dialectic dynamic, okay? So closure of constraints realizes self-determination since the constrained overall dynamics determine the conditions required for the continued existence of the constraints. That's the co-generational dialectic here. And that is organizational closure. So I believe, and not everybody agrees with me on this, that this uh, uh, idea of the closure of constraints is a fundamentally dynamic concept, okay? You only, you, the, the relational schemes, they don't, they're impredicative. They don't do anything if they're not put into dynamics, this sort of co-generation, co-emergent dynamic that we were looking at before. This is really mind boggling for me. It took me a long time to get my head around this. So I encourage you to think about this, to read up on it. It's really hard to explain it in just two lectures, but I hope that I could give you sort of a feeling of what the closure, organizational closure in general and the closure of constraints or the closure to efficient causation is in uh, real biochemical terms. So these theories are well enough defined that we can look at these phenomena in the cell. Now, to come back, we'll come back to the, the, the methodological problem of that uh, in a bit, but I, I, I want to, because these, these um, concepts are so difficult, I want to, to sort of just explain them a little bit more, okay? So this closure and constraints of constraints account, as I told you, is fundamentally based on the idea that you have processes, underlying processes, versus constraints on top. So this is a bit of repetition, but this is fundamentally important. Okay, so the processes are the transformations, physical processes, chemical reactions, et cetera, that occur in biological systems and involve alteration, consumption, production, and or constitution of entities, like the building blocks and the macromolecules that are produced in, in metabolism. Constraints are entities, parts that act upon the processes but remain unaffected by them, very simply put. They can be external, or internal to the system. So your organization, and that's important, can depend on external factors like nutrients, environmental triggers, et cetera. That's okay. The system is only closed to efficient causation, not um, to matter or energy. Reduce, they can reduce the degrees of freedom of the processes on which they act. We've been through that. And so let's introduce a little bit of notation that I want to use and this is work by Alvaro Moreno and Matteo Mosio and Mael Monteville, I want to use their um, scheme to explain uh, this, this concept of closure a bit more clearly once again. So they use this sort of notation where they have an underlying physical process, physical chemical process, A, B, it looks like the mapping in Rosen, but it's, this is some sort of process that's happening here and a constraint uh, represented by the zigzag arrow that is working on, okay? 
And this is very important. So, so constraints are time scale dependent. They happen um, at a certain time scale. Okay, they are not changing at a certain time scale, but enzymes, for example, are also degraded and renewed at a much slower time scale. So they are only constraints at the time scale of metabolic reaction. And of course, they're context dependent. Enzymes are very specific to the reactions and the substrates that they use for catalysis. Okay, so constraints are time scale and context dependent. We'll come back to the context dependence in next lecture. And uh, to map this back so the processes can be equated to the material causes in Rosen scheme and the constraints to the efficient causes. This is why the closure to efficient causation translates into the closure of constraints here. Constraints are a specific type of efficient cause. Now you can build up a network by saying, okay, so at longer time scales, we can have, um, you know, constraints must also be replaced, like uh, the renewal of enzymes. Here you have a process A to C, that's, that's now producing the constraints. They have to be repaired, maintained, replaced, okay, at a different time scale. And now in this scheme, you can say, okay, this constraint is dependent on this constraint, which is generative for this constraint. Okay, a very simple formalism. And now, <laughs> look at this diagram. This is closure, okay? So you have a cascade of constraints. So C3, C2, C4 are all constraints within the organisms, within the organism. And you can see that um, there are a few normal constraints. They are uh, working on processes that happen at a shorter time scale. And then one constraint is happening at a very short time scale, but it works upwards here, up uh, the time levels to a slower process. And you can see that every constraint in the system is caused by another constraint, in efficiently caused by another constraint in the system. There are additional constraints that come from the outside. That's okay. So the system doesn't have to be closed even to causation, but all the essential uh, uh, you know, um, efficient causes that you need to maintain your living state need to be accounted for from within the system. So closure is a specific case of mutual dependencies where each constitutive constraint is both dependent on and generative for at least one other constraint. So we come straight back to Kant. This is a formalization of what Kant said. Every part of the organism is both productive and produced by another, uh, off and by another part of the system. Okay, so organization, this is important, is not a static network of relations, constraints. It does not pre-exist ideally somewhere, abstractly, um, before its material realization. Processes and their constraints, this is the central message of this lecture. They constitute each other, they generate each other through their dialectic dynamic interplay. They're very Marxist, not Churchill in this, uh, in this sense. Dialectic dynamic interplay. And so here's a quote uh, from a paper, oops, uh, from uh, a paper by my collaborator, philosopher James D. Frisco. And uh, he is saying organisms are not automata that produce themselves according to a pre-established blueprint. Again, they're not machines at all. So it's not a simple copying sort of process. We'll come back to that when we talk about evolution. They are the contingent product of processes that may have produced something else. That's why they have autonomy, okay? They are, their behavior is fundamentally unpredictable. Their actions are initiated from within. This is amazing and it's, it's, it's really, 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 really hard to understand we're so sort of preconditioned by mechanistic thinking, but of course it's a problem for me, mechanistic explanation. Okay, we'll come back to that in the next lecture. Just to finish up, I want to um, sort of follow up on, on James's uh, quote that says, you know, organisms, not just cells, any organism, they are not machines, okay? So we need, instead of the machine conception of the organism, we need something new. So um, Dan Nicholson proposes um, uh, what he calls the stream of life conception of the organism. He says, living forms are not in being, they are happening. Digest that for a second. They are the expression of a perpetual stream of matter and energy which passes the organism and at the same time constitutes it. So 
much more, maybe like a, a, a stream, a rushing stream down a mountain, but much more like a flame, which is also a dissipative system. But the flame doesn't regenerate. So it's like a flame that could feed itself without running out of fuel. It's a fascinating sort of idea. And he draws three lessons. Uh, Dan Nicholson draws three lessons from this, in, uh, this, this sort of view of life. One is that, again, to be is to act. The system is what a system does. Activity is a necessary condition for existence. This needful freedom that Hans Jonas was talking about. Identity is grounded in continuous self-maintenance of form. So um, you have a diachronic identity. You are who you are because you were you before, and there is a continuity. We'll come back to that as well, don't worry. Order does not entail design. This is very important, no blueprint. Self-modifying dynamic organization is much more important. So this is all self-organization, not a machine that copies itself. And again, we'll revisit that when we talk about evolution, of course. Fundamentally important insights when we tackle evolutionary questions in the second half of the lecture. So I wanna end with this beautiful quote by Dan, um, who says, the crucial point is that if we want an ontology of life that is grounded and informed by natural science, then a processual account seems unavoidable. So we have to look at organisms as processes. Whatever else organisms may be, what cannot be denied at an ontological level, so at the real, the level of reality, is that they are stable metabolic flows of energy and matter. So if we want to understand organisms as a whole, we cannot get around taking a process perspective and trying to dismantle them, to decompose them as much as we want, come up with parts lists, genomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics, whatever you want to do. Uh, networks is not, is missing the point, is not going to get you an understanding of what life is because it misses the global organization and the peculiar type of organization that an organism has. And this organization, this sort of Marxist dialectic co-constitution of different processes has fundamental implications for mechanistic explanation. And we'll talk about the limitations of that in next lecture. Thank you for listening, and I hope you'll uh, tune in again next time. Bye now.